Hi, everyone. Welcome to Words and Pictures Festival 2021. We're very excited to have you here today. Uh, this is our fifth season of doing Words and Pictures at Fort Vancouver Regional Libraries and our second year doing it online. My name is Diane Clark and I am um, a public services librarian with the Vancouver Community Library. I'm joined today by uh, Steve and he is from the Cascade Park uh, Community Library and he's going to be helping us out today with some technical um, uh, issues. Uh, just a few housekeeping things before I introduce our speakers today. Um, please keep yourself muted while the authors are speaking. Uh, you can put any questions you might have into the chat and we will monitor them and ask them at the end. I'm very happy today to join, uh, be joined today by Heidi Mason and Allison Cochran. I'm sorry, I hope I pronounced your names right. <laughs> um, Heidi will be going first. Heidi is an Ohio girl transplanted into the Pacific Northwest. She is a people watching introvert who can be found hiding in the nearest corner. When not writing, she loves rainy days at the beach, old houses and antiques, researching family history, reading and getting lost inside of her own thoughts. She's a lover of caffeine, so she fits in very well in the Pacific <laughs> Northwest and a hopeless romantic at heart. A multi-published author of romance of, in the romance genre, she moved into new writing territory, territory in 2019 when she crossed genres. Nothing Hidden Ever Stays, her debut gothic suspense novel became an Amazon bestseller. And I will turn it over to you, Heidi. Hi, um, thanks for being here. It's uh, good to kind of see all of you. Um, <laughs> my name is Heidi Mason. Um, I am the author of 10 books, um, two of which are yet to be published. Um, I have one that will be released next month and one that's still in the submissions process. Um, I write under two different pen names in two uh, separate genres. Um, I write supernatural suspense um, under H.R. Mason. And then I write women's fiction and romance under Heidi Renee Mason. I'm married and I have three daughters and I homeschooled my kiddos before it was cool. So, <laughs> so uh, well, we're having no pro with that. Um, and I, today I'm gonna read from my latest release. It's Daughters of the Sea. Um, this is under the Supernatural Suspense name. Um, and I thought that I would start by reading the author's note because it gives a little bit of background on the story and how that came to be. And then um, I will read, depending on how long it takes, I'll read a chapter or two. All right, Daughters of the Z, author's note. Did you know that most of my story ideas begin with a question? Often, I don't even realize I Sorry, Heidi, I'm sorry, I, ex I I bumped you and I muted you. I am so sorry if you could start again. I'm so sorry. All right. <laughs> Are we ready? Am I good? Okay. Did you know that most of my story ideas begin with a question? Often, I don't even realize I've asked the question until I start looking for the answer. Once I begin digging, it's only a matter of time before the real story surfaces and the characters begin to speak to me. When I began writing Daughters of the Sea, I started out on an entirely different path from where I eventually ended up. I've always been a bit obsessed with Salem, Massachusetts and witches. The idea that so many people could be wrongfully accused and put to death without any real concrete evidence has always blown my mind. I wanted to write something that had to do with history because I adore historical research but I also wanted to throw in a bit of the supernatural as well. Salem and witches seemed to be the perfect fit. I began digging into witch trials and I was surprised at the details that came up in my search. Witch hunting was so much broader and so much more widespread than I ever realized. It went far beyond Salem and happened much earlier in other parts of the world. About that same time, I was digging into my own family history and I had just come across a connection to my Norwegian heritage. 
It was the perfect storm for two of my passions, history and genealogy, to collide. As I was searching, I learned about a witch trial in Norway, and the details wouldn't leave me alone. Given my newly discovered family connections to the country, I was intrigued. I began reading, and what I found was shocking. In the remote region in northern Norway lies a coastal village called Varda, with the catchy moniker, which capital of Norway. Needless to say, I was hooked. Between 1593 and 1692, there were more than 140 witch trials in this small community. 91 people were found guilty of witchcraft and executed. Well, that number might not sound like much, given the fact that the area is sparsely populated, it is an astronomically high number. They even have a monument, which was constructed 348 years after the trials as a way to commemorate the events. As I began to read about the trials, my first thoughts were one of anger and sadness. It seemed unthinkable that so many innocent people could be condemned and executed. I tried to imagine what it would have been like to live in that village, waking up in fear every day that you might be the next one who was accused. It must have been such a feeling of helplessness, especially for the women who made up the vast majority of those accused and condemned. Then another thought popped into my brain. What if you were a woman who actually was different? What if you were a woman who had some kind of power that you couldn't explain? What if all the women in your family had the same power? That would certainly be a death sentence. What would you do to survive? Daughters of the Sea was born from my research and endless questioning. It blends the historical with the supernatural in a way that I hope you'll love. Perhaps it will leave you with some lingering questions of your own. Maybe someday I'll write the book about the Salem witches, but for now, I give you the Norwegian ones. All right, so I'm gonna start with the prologue. Varda, Norway, winter, 1621. Helga ran, her lungs exploding with pain. The frigid air nipped at her cheeks and sliced razor blades into her feet, cutting straight through the soles of her leather boots. Not daring to stop for even a second, she ventured a furtive glance behind her. Relief flooded her upon realizing she had momentarily escaped the band of angry men in her wake. Ducking behind an abandoned barn, Helga plastered her small body against the splintered wood. Struggling to catch her breath, she gazed across the field of snow-covered ice. The bitter howling wind of the barren sea scattered snowflakes all around, the flurries obscuring her vision. She listened as the waves crashed in the distance, pounding against the rocks along the rugged shore. Her home, Varda, felt cut off from the rest of the world. The steady rhythm of the ocean hummed in every cell of her body. She breathed in the salty air and worked to calm her pounding heart. The village had always been her safe haven, and until recently, she couldn't imagine living anywhere else. But the panic set in and everything changed. If Helga didn't get away soon, she wouldn't get away at all. Glancing around, she stealthily slid along the length of the old shack and quickly ducked inside. She climbed the rickety ladder leading up to the barn's loft, moving carefully, knowing the weight of her slight body might be too much for the rotting wood floor. Crouching in the corner of the loft, Helga peered through the cracks in the wall. The men were approaching, each carrying a torch, their flames flickering in the polar night sky. The silhouettes of their bodies were awash with the blue and green northern lights flickering in the heavens above. Helga, Helga could feel the pulsing collars of the Nordlands vibrating within her own body. The rainbow of lights had always given her a sense of complete connection with nature, seeming to bridge the gap between her and all of creation. They gave her the strength to do what she must. A rippling sensation trickled through her body, her pale blonde hair lifting and swirling as a sudden breeze made its way through the barn. She breathed deeply, closing her blue eyes and envisioning the breeze turning into a gale force wind. Picturing the wind in her mind, Helga imagined it extinguishing the flames of the men's torches. Sade, so be it, she whispered. As the thought entered her mind and the words came out of her mouth, every torch flickered before going out completely. Helga smiled to herself as the familiar flow of electricity coursed through her body. The men's angry, vo angry voices echoed in the night as they stumbled, trying to figure out what had happened. She waited quietly, and after several minutes, the men headed back to the fortress of Vardo. Exhaling heavily, Helga sank onto one of the bales of hay at her feet. She must follow the plan, even if she didn't want to. If she failed, she would find herself on trial, like so many other women in her village. The panic had spread like wildfire, and she tried her best to remain in the shadows, 
Unfortunately, her gift had a way of thrusting her into the light. She had always been proud of her abilities, so much like those of her mother and grandmother, yet distinctly her own. Her twin sister, Becca, also had the gift. Together, the girls had been a powerful force. Their mother called, them, called the twins the generation of two, believing their magic was unstoppable. The problem was that the generation of two had to sacrifice something in order to be granted such power. In their case, the sacrifice had been too great. Becca was taken away, the payment for the possession of intense magic. When Becca drowned as a young girl, Helga nearly died of grief herself. Losing her twin was a wound she would bear forever. The women in Helga's family were part of a legacy. She was simply one link in a long chain of women whose special abilities couldn't be explained. Helga believed her powers came from God. Others believed their origin was darker. Her mother said their gifts were given so they might serve others, just as, the, just as they had done for generations. But now their gifts were misunderstood, putting them all in danger. The tragedy began when several fishermen perished at sea in a deadly storm. Because no one could explain the events, the women of the village were blamed. They were accused of sorcery, of making pacts with the devil. It was said that the women opened their wind knots, blowing up a storm to make the fishermen's boat sink. Since then, Varda had become a dangerous place, filled with murmurings and finger pointing. One terrifying word struck fear in Helga's heart as it was hurled throughout the town, witch. As more innocents were accused, Helga's worry grew. The people in the village knew of her abilities. She had used her gifts to help the townspeople since she was a small girl, always willing to do what she could to ease her neighbor's pain, to take their discomfort upon herself, to feel the sickness leave their body as she gazed into their eyes. Now those eyes bored into her, viewing her not with gratitude, but with anger and fear. She wasn't safe and she wondered whether she would be again. Her gifts could only cause her harm. If she wanted to stay alive, she had to leave Varda. She would follow her mother's final instructions, sneak to the harbor and sail away with Finn, the Dutch fisherman who believed Helga could control the weather. Else had promised Finn her daughter's hand in marriage. She had sweetened the deal by convincing him that Helga would ensure the safety of himself and his crew. It was her mother's final act of love, a dangerous effort to keep her daughter safe. Helga had no idea what awaited her beyond the shores of Varda, or if she would ever return to her beloved village. She didn't even know if she had the strength to carry out the plan, but she had to try. When the angry band of men dragged her mother away, Helga knew that Varda could no longer be her home. Her mother's hastily whispered final words before her death gave Helga the way out. It was risky, but it was her only chance. Helga crept, crept from the barn, bracing herself against the chilling wind. As she ran toward the shore, she remembered the last time she spoke to her mother, just moments before her mother was burned at the stake. I will not leave you, mother. I must stay, Helga cried as she gripped her mother's hand. Take this. It is your legacy. It will keep you safe. Her mother removed the Ansu's rune necklace from her own neck and placed it around Helga's. I can't leave you, Helga sobbed as she rolled the pendant within her fingers. I'm not long for this world, you must go. Her mother's beautiful eyes were wild with determination. Do you have it? The book? Yes, that book is all we have left. Guard it with your life. Why is the book so important, mother? It tells our story. You will add yours to its pages, continue our legacy. Yes, mother, Helga nodded as she sobbed. My blessed daughter, I am at peace because you will survive. How can you be sure? Have you seen it in a vision? I have seen it clearly, her mother answered with a smile. But where will I go? That I have not seen. But one thing I know for certain, no matter where you go, you will always be my daughter of the sea. So then we're gonna to move to chapter one, present day. Departure Cove, Oregon. Runa Brandon hated change. In her mind, there was nothing better than the perfect sameness of an ordinary day. She loved predictability and routine, preferring to always do the same thing. She was afraid of rocking the boat and venturing into the unknown. Maybe it was the fear of the unfamiliar that prevented her from moving forward, instead keeping her stuck in the quagmire of the past. It was the only excuse she had for staying with her abusive, controlling ex-fiance for as long as she had. Runa had a knack for holding on when she should simply let go. Glancing nervously around the storefront, stacked from floor to ceiling with, with boxes, Runa fidgeted with the ring on her right hand. 
The sterling silver Ansu's rune symbol was given to her by her mother, Asta, for her 16th birthday. A follower of all things mystical, Asta said the ring would inspire insight and wisdom. So far, Runa didn't think it had done much good. She thought Asta's beliefs were a bunch of hocus pocus, but she cherished the jewelry because it came from her mother. Here's another box. Where do you want it? Asta, slightly out of breath, blew a strand of wayward hair from her eyes. I'll grab it, thanks. Runa hefted the box from Asta's hand and stacked it in on top of the glass counter. I don't know about you, but I'm beat, Asta sighed. Too old for all this physical labor. Old? I don't think so, Mom, Runa laughed. Asta grabbed her nearby water bottle and took several large gulps. Runa grinned as her mother wiped beads of perspiration from her upper lip. At 47, Asta didn't look a day over 30. She certainly didn't look old enough to be the mother of a 29-year-old. With their long, pale blonde hair, blue eyes, and overall Nordic good looks, the two women were often mistaken for sisters, which never bothered Runa. She had always been proud to look like her mother, but although they were nearly, nearly mirror images of each other, their resemblance ended at the physical. Asta, a massage therapist and energy healer, was confident, bold, and fearless. She grabbed life with both hands and held on for the ride. She knew exactly who she was and what she wanted. Runa had always envied Asta's medal and secretly wished that some of it would rub off on her. In contrast, Runa was fearful, questioning, and uncertain. She was a bit naive, too kind-hearted for her own good, and had a hard time seeing the bad in anyone, qualities which made her the target of abuse in more than one relationship. When Runa finally ended things with her fiance, it was long overdue. She'd been broken for so long, she couldn't remember how it felt to be whole. When Runa told Asta she was leaving Portland, Oregon and moving to the tiny coastal town of Departure Cove, her mother thought she'd lost her mind. But opening Runa's, her upscale clothing boutique, felt like the right thing to do. It was the first decision in a long time of which Runa felt certain. Although she was supportive of her daughter's plan to start a new life, Asta was openly uneasy about the town in which she'd chosen to do, chosen to do so. Departure Cove was a new town for her daughter, but it felt all too familiar for Asta. It was the one in which she'd grown up, the place she'd told Runa she couldn't wait to leave. For Asta, Departure Cove held too many bad memories, and she'd shared her wishes that her daughter choose anywhere else. She'd suggested several alternate locations, but Runa remained steadfast in her plan, knowing that Departure Cove was the right place for her to set up shop. Can't believe we're standing here in your boutique in my hometown. Asta shook her head slowly, trying to wrap her brain around it. It's perfect, isn't it? I know Departure Cove wasn't your first choice for me, but it's going to be great, Mom, Runa smiled. I'm sure you're right, sweetie. Asta smiled, but Runa noticed the expression didn't quite reach her mother's eyes. Runa had visited Departure Cove only once in her life before moving there. She'd been a girl of only 10 years old when she and Asta had gone for her grandmother's funeral. Runa had only seen a picture of her grandmother, but she felt a connection to the woman who so closely resembled her and her mother. Although the visit to Departure Cove had been brief and long ago, it made a lasting impression on Runa. She was drawn to the gray skies, the frequent drizzle, and the sound of waves crashing on the shore. She felt compelled, called by the water. She'd always wanted to live near the ocean, but had never been willing to take the plunge. After her breakup, it was time to make a change. As much as she feared the unknown, something pulled her toward the small seaside town. What Runa hadn't shared with her mother was that she'd been dreaming of Departure Cove since she was a child. She'd always known she would end up there, although she didn't understand why. About a year, about a year before, the dreams began occurring frequently, vivid dreams of Departure Cove and Runa's place in it. She saw herself living there, operating a business. She dreamed of the house she would move into and the building where she would open Runa's. When she began searching for houses and storefronts, she'd found the exact home and business she dreamed of on the classified page of the Departure Cove Sentinel. They were there, waiting for her. Everything had happened quickly. Runa signed the rental contracts on both the house and the business within a week. In spite of her reservations, Asta was nothing but supportive of her daughter. She'd taken time off, traveled the two hours from Portland to Departure Cove, rolled up her sleeves, and helped Runa move into her new life. That was the kind of mother she was, and Runa was grateful. She knew she couldn't do it alone. Runa loved Asta fiercely. Her mother had been the one constant throughout her life, and she was thankful for the woman's strength. Asta was Runa's true north. She needed her, especially now when her life was in a state of complete chaos. They had always been a tight unit, a team. It was the two of them against the world. 
Just 18 when Runa was born, Asta had left Departure Cove and never looked back. She never mentioned Runa's father and Runa didn't ask. When she was young, it hadn't really mattered. Asta was father and mother all rolled, all rolled into one and Runa never questioned a paternal absence. As she got older, she became curious. She broached the subject once and Asta told her her father was dead. The sadness she'd seen in her mother's eyes made Runa never speak of him again. It's not quite the whole first chapter, but I see that we're at 120, so. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, can I ask a quick question? Of course. So you, you've published a lot of romance novels. What prompted the switch to the gothic suspense? Well, um, my first, uh, my debut novel in that genre under the new pen name was Nothing Hidden Ever Stays. And the story idea for that um, came to me probably about four or five years ago, um, I was reading a newspaper article that I came across um, from the 1950s. And it was about a serial killer. And he just so happened to live in the tiny little small town that I'm from in Ohio. Um, and I just wondered, you know, how, how, how could I have grown up there and have never, I never had any idea. Um, and so this this idea just kept just kept it was in the back of my mind and it just wouldn't go away and I'm like I don't that's that's not the kind of book that I write I don't write that kind of book um but the idea would not it just kept kind of you know circling around and getting bigger and turning into something else entirely and I'm like this is actually a really good story idea but it's just not the kind of book I write um so when it decided not to leave me alone for like four years, I decided that, well, maybe I could write this kind of book. Um, so I kind of took the plunge and decided I was going to write under two different pen names and try a little bit of a new path. And it's been a lot of fun. That book actually went on to win the um, American Fiction Award for Suspense. So um, I guess it was a good idea <laughs> that, that I that I listened to that story idea. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just have to listen to that voice in your, you know, that keeps going. And yes, it, it wouldn't let up. So yeah, yeah, there there was a reason. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for sharing. Um, does anybody have any questions for Heidi at this time? We can also take questions at the end of the hour if we have time. Um, feel free to post your questions in the um, chat. Um, I also want to, I forgot to mention this before, most of our books um, by our authors um, can be pin, uh, <clears throat> purchased, excuse me, at Vintage Books, and um, we will share that link online. Um, so um, I'm gonna, oh, we have, there's the, there's the information for Vintage Books. Um, so, uh, let me just quick do something. Okay. Um, so how, have, I just want to ask a really quick question too. Um, how has this, um, our current situation in the world <laughs> impacted your writing? Uh, has it given you more time to write? Do you find it more difficult to write or how is that going? Well, when it first started, I thought, you know, how great all this time at home. Um, <laughs> but it didn't really work out that way for me. Um, I had a lot of trouble writing. Um, I, I So much of my ideas and inspiration come from watching other people. Um, I love to watch people and just how they interact in the world. And um, without the ability to do that, I realized that I just, there, there, there just wasn't much happening <laughs> in my brain. Um, so I, I, I had a really hard time. I yeah. had just started a new book last year when everything kind of shut down and I, I worked on it and I tried and finally I put it aside and I actually didn't finish that book until um, August, just a couple of months ago. Um, but I wrote a completely different book because that one just seemed to be working better for the headspace that I was in. So, yeah, 
Well, yeah, I know it. It's it's interesting to see how it's affected some of um, our authors that we've had uh, differently, and and um, some people drew inspiration from it, and some people did have the difficulty. Um, like you experienced. And I'm really glad that you were able to, you know, finish the one that you worked on and, and maybe the one that, you know, that you wrote while we were shut down. Um, maybe that is something that you just needed to do too. So that's awesome. Yes. Well, that one actually is coming out next month. So it, it oh. worked, it worked out. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, okay. I'll look forward to that. Okay. Um, uh, next up, I'm going to introduce our next author. Thank you, Heidi. Um, Thank you. That was a wonderful reading. And um, next up we have uh, Allison Cochran. Allison is a high school English teacher living outside Portland, Oregon. And when she's not reading and writing queer love stories, you can find her torturing her teenagers with Shakespeare, crafting perfect tra travel itineraries. Ooh, that's a, something I wish I could do. I hate watching reality dating shows and searching for the best happy hour nachos. So I am going to um, turn it over to Allison and thank you for joining us. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. So um, I'm Allison. I've been a high school English teacher at actually Mountain View High School in Vancouver um, for 11 years. Uh, and then this year, so September 7th, my debut novel, The Charm Offensive, came out. Um, I write uh, contemporary romance, specifically I write queer romantic comedies. And so that is the genre of my debut book that I will be reading from here in a minute. Um, and then my second book uh, is also coming out from Simon & Schuster. That'll be a year from now. Um, and that is a like Christmas themed romantic comedy um, that I'm very excited about. But um, the book that I'm reading from today, The Charm Offensive, is set on um, a reality dating show. And so it is a queer romance set within the heteronormative world of reality dating. Um, and so it's about a uh, producer named Dave Deshpande, who is obsessed with fairy tale love and loves orchestrating um, the perfect romance for contestants who go on the reality dating show Ever After. And then it is about a very unlikely star of the reality dating show, Charlie Winshaw, uh, who agrees to appear on the show as like an attempt to salvage his reputation. Um, and of course, it is a love story, so you can just figure out pretty much what happens from there. Um, I should mention I'm currently on a uh, research trip for my third book, uh, and due to a slight scheduling snafu, I am doing this event from a, a mostly empty hotel conference room, so I'm very sorry about any background noise as I read. Um, I was supposed to be able to, yeah, anyway, doesn't matter. Um, but I am out here doing research. I'm in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico right now. Um, and so, yeah, but um, I am going to read from my book. Um, I am not, I'm going to actually start with chapter two. Uh, so the Charm Offensive is told, it's a dual point of view book. So it includes both Dave and Charlie's perspectives. And uh, this is the beginning of Charlie's perspective um, in the beginning of the book on the first night of filming as he is like preparing to become uh, the star of this reality dating show where he will be dating um, 20 women. Okay, so I will go ahead and begin. Do we think the crown is a bit much? Maureen Scott doesn't look up from her phone or in any way acknowledge he's spoken. Charlie shifts awkwardly in the town car back seat, the tucks pulling across his chest in all the wrong ways. His body hasn't felt like his own since they waxed it and tanned it and drenched it in very pungent cologne. The least they could do is let him remove the crown so he doesn't look like a stripper Prince William. He even had to double check the tux wasn't a tearaway. It's not. However, there were enough nudity clauses in his contract to raise legitimate concern. He looks down at the magazine lying casually on the seat between them and experiences the cognitive dissonance of seeing photos of himself. If he could look in a mirror right now, he knows his face would be sweaty and red, pinched together anxiously in the corners of his eyes and the corners of his mouth. But the man on the magazine cover isn't anxious about anything. His face is smooth, his eyes friendly, his mouth casually tilting in the corner. The man on the magazine cover is a stranger. 
the man on the magazine cover is a lie, a lie he has to live for the next two months. He's made a deal with the proverbial devil and he can't control much about his circumstances at the moment, but at the very least, he can take off this stupid plastic crown. He reaches up, don't do that, dear, Maureen Scott snaps, eyes still on her phone. Even with that dear, there is an edge to her words and his hands fall limply at his sides. He's stuck with the crown then. Or he could jump out of this moving vehicle and abort this foolish, misguided publicity stunt right now. He tests the door handle, but of course it's locked. He's been labeled a flight risk, which is why the show's creator is personally escorting him from the studio to the set. Two days ago, Ever After took him to a beach where they expected him to ride a white horse for the intro package, like the Prince Charming he's supposed to be. Prince Charmings are supposed to intrinsically know how to ride horses. They're definitely not supposed to be afraid of horses. Instead of looking strapping and manly, he kept slouching and delaying production and grimacing with every uncomfortable jostle of the saddle until the sun was gone and everyone was generally pissed with the shots. The bald woman running set called him freaking uncoachable which sounds about right, honestly. He tries to remember what his publicist said before he left. You're Charlie freaking Winshaw. You built a billion dollar tech company before you got your braces off. You can handle ever after. But I lost my tech company, he had muttered in response. Parisa pretended not to hear him. She knows what he lost. That's why he's here. This is his last chance to get it all back. He feels the pressure of it weighing down on him, and before his generalized anxiety turns the corner into a full-blown panic attack, he runs through his coping strategies. Three deep breaths, count to 30 in seven languages, tap out the Morse code for calm 13 times on his knee. Maureen Scott stops jabbing her thumbs against the phone screen and looks at him, really looks at him for the first time all evening. What are we going to do with you, she muses, her voice sickly sweet. He wants to remind her she is the one who sought him out. She's the one who pestered his publicist for months until he agreed to do the show. He says nothing. You need to relax, she drawls, as if, some, as if telling someone to relax has ever once in the history of human beings yielded that outcome. Maureen's silver gray bob swishes stylishly as she shoots him a threatening look. All of our futures are riding on this. You need personal rebranding for obvious reasons. The show does too. Don't screw this up for everyone. He would like the record to show that he does not screw things up on purpose. He would very much like to be a not screwing things up sort of person. If he were that sort of person, he wouldn't be the new star of a reality dating show. Maureen narrows shrewd eyes at him. Stop looking so gloomy, darling. You get to date 20 beautiful women, and when it's over, you will propose to whoever is left standing. What's so awful about that? What's so awful about dating on television when he hasn't gone on a real date in two years? What's so awful about getting fake engaged to an almost stranger on the slim promise he might be able to work again when this is over? Nothing, nothing at all. He feels great about all of this. In other news, he's probably going to vomit. And who knows, Maureen says cloyingly, maybe you'll even find real love by the end. He won't. That's the one thing he knows for absolute certain. The car comes to a smooth stop and Maureen pockets her phone. Now, when we get out, you'll meet Dave, your new handler, and he'll coach you through the entrance ceremony. Charlie wants to ask what was wrong with his old handler, but the driver turns off the engine, and without another word, Maureen gets out of the car and disappears into the night. He's not sure if he's supposed to follow her or just sit in the car like a pretty puppet until someone shows up to pull his strings. He chooses the former, refusing to relinquish every ounce of his free will as he embarks on this two-month journey through reality television hell. He dramatically throws his weight against the door, which gives with suspicious ease, because it turns out someone is opening the door at that exact moment. He's thrown off balance. In one fluid motion, he lands face down at someone's feet. Shit, are you okay? Suddenly, there are hands on him, hoisting him into a standing position, exactly like a pretty puppet. The hands belong to a tall man with dark skin whose Adam's apple is at Charlie's eyeline. There is something disconcerting about having to look up that drastically at another person. He looks up. Dramatic cheekbones and intense eyes behind plastic framed glasses and an amused mouth. The man gripping the front of his tux, Dave, slides his fingers into Charlie's hair to adjust the crown. And it's too much. Too much touching, too much everything, too quickly. The, the anxiety hijacks his brain, and in a panic, he throws himself backward against the car door to break contact. The new handler raises a single eyebrow in response. So no touching then? 
he flashes Charlie a crooked smile, like this is all a big joke. Touching is never a joke to Charlie. He doesn't hate it as a general rule, but he does prefer advanced warning and for hand sanitizer to be involved. He knows he signed up for this show where touching is required, so he attempts to explain. You can touch me anywhere you like, he starts. And re he realizes he's phrased this inelegantly when the man's other eyebrow shoots up. Wait, no, uh, what I meant was, I don't mind being touched by you, but if you could just, um, if you could wash your hands first, not that I think you're unclean, I'm sure you are, are very clean, I mean, you smell clean, but I have this thing about germs, and if you could maybe warn me before you touch me, this is what he gets for attempting verbal communication with a stranger. At first, his handler simply stares at him in open mouth silence, then, no, he says firmly, get back in the car. Dave yanks the door back open and kicks at Charlie's legs with the toe of his converse. Charlie's re-entrance into the car is about as graceful as his exit two minutes before. He tries to scoot backward to make room for the very tall man who is now halfway sitting on top of him. Dave asks the driver to get out. I'm sorry, Charlie blurts. Apologizing always seems like a good idea when he doesn't understand a social situation and he has absolutely no idea what's happening right now. Please stop talking. Dave plunges his hands into a gigantic shoulder bag and pulls out a tiny bottle of green hand sanitizer. He lathers his hands, and Charlie is weirdly moved by the gesture. Then, when he realizes the hand sanitizer means more touching, he is weirdly freaked out by the gesture. Lean forward, Dave orders. Uh, hurry, lean forward. Charlie leans, and this total stranger reaches around his back and untucks his shirt, warm fingers sliding across his skin. And yes, in the past few days, he's learned LA types are very weird about both personal space and naked bodies, but Charlie is not an LA type. He's not accustomed to being groped in cars by men wearing truly heinous uh, cargo shorts. Dave's fingers feel like pinpricks every time they make contact as he fondles the nude colored mic belt wardrobe put on Charlie back at the studio. After 15 excruciating seconds, which Charlie counts out one Mississippi at a time to stop himself from spiraling, Dev pulls away and slumps back against the seat. Charlie finally exhales. <sighs> Holy shit, dude, you were hot. I, I, I what? Your mic. Dave points to the place where Charlie's shirt is now untucked in the back and then points to his own earpiece where someone is presumably shouting things. Someone left your mic on from earlier and you're back in receiver range. Always be wary of a hot mic. Consider this the first lesson from your new handler. Anything you say can be taken out of context. Your soliloquy about letting me touch you could easily be inserted into a very different kind of scene. Oh, he suddenly reminded it's June in Southern California and he's sweating without the air conditioning. Right, uh, okay, right, yeah, sorry. From two feet away, his new handler studies him carefully behind his glasses. Charlie holds eye contact for one Mississippi, two Mississippi, then looks down and nervously adjusts his cuffs. Did you get hurt when you fell out of the car? Dave asks softly. You look like you're in pain. Oh, uh, no. Dave dives back into his shoulder bag. I've got painkillers and tiger balm and band-aids. What do you need? Nothing, he mutters. I I'm fine. Dave is cradling an entire first aid kit in his arms. But your face, it's all pinched together like you're in pain. Um, that's just my face. At that, Dave throws his head back and laughs. One of Charlie's chief failures in life is his inability to understand when someone is laughing with him versus laughing at him. Nine times out of 10, it's the latter. It's confusing, Dev notes in a tone that almost makes Charlie think he's laughing with him, because you look like the guy in a fancy cologne commercial, but you're distinctly acting like the guy in an IBS medication commercial. I can be both of those guys simultaneously. Not on this show, you can't. Dave pulls out the People magazine from under him and jabs a finger at the face on the cover. If this whole thing is going to work, you've got to be this guy for the cameras. Charlie stares at the magazine version of himself, fumbling for a way to explain. I'm not that guy. I don't know how to be that guy. This was a huge mistake. I, the car door behind Dev opens. He manages quite easily not to fall out. Dave, what the fuck are you doing in here? We're behind schedule and Skylar is going to demote us to casting if we don't get the prince to his effing mark this effing instant. The petite foul mouth shoves her arms through Charlie. Uh, Jules Liu. Nice to meet you. I'm your production assistant. It's my job to make sure that you're where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there, and you're not where you're supposed to be right now. Sorry, he stares at her hand, but doesn't take it. Uh, you also meet. Does he think that was a sentence? Jules asks Dave. 
God, we're screwed. Jules yanks Dave out of the car and Dave yanks Charlie out of the car and anything Charlie was going to say to Dave gets swallowed up by the madness all around them. They head up a path toward the set, which is supposed to look like a fairy tale. The castle is lit up in the distance and the show's host, Mark Davenport, waits in front of an ornate fountain. There are twinkle lights and flowers and a a horse-drawn carriage ripped straight out of Cinderella. It should look like a fairy tale, but the castle is actually just a millionaire's house in Pasadena, and there are crew members dressed in black, shouting and vaping. Mark Davenport screams at his assistant about kombucha until she cries. So like, not quite Walt Disney's vision. Stand here for me, Dave motions to a little tape X, and he warns Charlie before he slides his hand around Charlie's back to click on his mic. Charlie tenses. This is it. He can't undo it, can't back out, can't hide. If he thinks too hard about the past year and all the things that led him here to this single act of desperation, he knows he won't be able to keep it together. Remember, Dave says in a low voice and close to his ear, everyone in Command Central can hear you now. Charlie swallows the lump forming in his throat. You look miserable. Oh, that's probably because I am miserable. Mike, I'm uh, miserably happy to be here. Very convincing save. You're a natural at this. Charlie smiles despite himself and Dave explodes with an enthusiastic, yes, yes. He turns his fingers into a box and squints one eye like he's lining up the shot. Just like that. Smile just like that when the cameras are on. Unfortunately, Charlie's smile collapses in on itself as soon as Dave draws attention to it. Well, now you look like you're going to vomit. I probably am. You're not going to vomit. You're about to meet 20 women who are all here on a quest to find love with you. Dave seems to think this is a delightful prospect, as if all of Charlie's fairy tale dreams are about to come true, as if Charlie has fairy tale dreams. This is going to be amazing. Dave forgets the advance notice for touching rule, and his hand folds around Charlie's bicep, burning through the layers of his tux. Charlie isn't sure what's happening to his body right now, but it's not good. It's maybe very, very bad. Dave leans in even closer. His breath is hot on Charlie's cheek. He smells like sugar and chocolate and something else Charlie can't quite place. I know you're freaked out right now, but at the end of all of this, you're going to find love, Dave whispers. In nine weeks, you're going to have a fiance. And that's when Charlie truly does vomit all over Dave. Um, Okay, yeah. That is the end of that chapter. Again, I'm so sorry about the brief background noise um, as hotel employees went past me. Um, Should I continue reading or should I stop there for today? Um, You have a little bit of time if you want to read a little bit more um, or if if there's something else that you, yeah. Okay. I can read a little bit further. So then it switches perspectives. And so this- We're getting a request for more. (laughs) Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, there is vomit on his chucks. Granted, there is always vomit on his shoes the first night of shooting, but it usually happens at dawn, not dusk, and the vomit typically belongs to an overserved contestant, not Prince Charming himself. Then again, it turns out Charles Winshaw is no one's definition of a Prince Charming, no matter how much he looks the part. And he really does look the part, broad-shouldered, with the tucks doing little to conceal his muscular build, straight-nosed and square-jawed and sweet. It's the sweetness that caught Dave off guard when Charles fell out of the town car. All the men who come on the show are handsome. None of them have ever been sweet. Then again, none of them have ever been quite this handsome. Charles Winshaw is somehow the most beautiful man Dave's ever seen in real life, even with the vomit in his chin dimple, even talking absolute nonsense, even with all the nervous sweating. Maybe especially with all the nervous sweating. I, I'm, I'm so, so, so sorry, he sputters. Any annoyance Dave feels about the vomit disappears when he looks up into Charles Winshaw's enormous eyes. He's like a terrified baby bird, like a 220 pound baby bird with crippling anxiety and a fairly intense germ phobia who can't navigate his way through a complete sentence. A man from set design comes over with a hose to casually clean the puke off the pavement and douses Dave with a burst of cold water, which is pretty par for the course on this night so far. I seriously, so sorry. Charles says again as the makeup team swoops in to fix his face without missing a beat. The vomit is cleared from his chin, the lights are adjusted, and from somewhere in the dark, the first AD shouts, final checks, please, whether Charles is ready to become Prince Charming or not. He's definitely not. He looks gray and sickly, and Dave wants to jump to stay, uh, and sorry, and Dave wants to stay by his side, but the AD calls to lock it up, and Dave jumps out of frame at the last second. 
They're rolling. The sound of a ho of horse hooves on wet flagstone fills the now silent set. And then the carriage comes into view, rolling up to the fountain where Charles is waiting. Camera one stays trained on Charles while camera two films the door opening. A woman in a blue dress steps out, big blue eyes to match her dress, blonde beach curls, slender figure. She smiles shyly when she sees Charles, a cross necklace framed in her plunging neckline. Her name is Daphne Reynolds, and she's the former beauty queen from Dave's Limo. It's no surprise Maureen sent her out of the carriage first. Quite frankly, she looks like someone fed a 3D printer the algorithm for creating an Ever After winner. Dave knows from her file that she has a college degree and her father's irreverent, which means she perfectly straddles the line of catering to the show's large conservative fan base without alienating its even larger feminist fan base, who claims to watch ironically. Hi, Daphne says, her heels now clacking on the stones. Charles does not say hi back. Charles does not move. He stands by the fountain, his arms stiff and awkward and maybe not attached to his body, and he does not react to the beautiful woman approaching him. No smile, not a flicker of lust. Perhaps in response to his indifference, Daphne hesitates as she gets closer, sputters, stops, and briefly looks like she's contemplating a leap over the gate. She takes another step forward, and her silvery heels either catch the hem of her dress or an especially wet stone, and she slips, topples forward directly into the immovable stoic wall that is Charles Winshaw. It's almost a perfect, albeit unconventional for this show, meet cute, except instead of putting out an arm to rescue Daphne, Charles flinches backwards at the physical contact with his chest. She manages to right herself without his help. Stop, stop, Skylar screams. The director bursts out of the command central tent and into the shot, even though the cameras never stop rolling on Ever After. What the hell was that? How can two sexy people be so offensively unsexy together? Take it again. Daphne's handler escorts her back to the carriage and they take the scene from the opening of the door. This time, Daphne doesn't trip, but Charles still looks disinterested and they shake hands like this is a board meeting. So they film the scene again and again. By the fifth take, Jules is turtling into her overalls from secondhand embarrassment. Charles looks like he might vomit again from all the stress and Skylar is screaming profanities into everyone's earpieces. Dave has to do something before the season actually is epically screwed. He waves his hands in front of the camera to get Skylar's attention back at Command Central and requests a five minute break. Then he darts across the courtyard toward the first limo where the contestants wait for their carriage ride. Ladies, he greets as he slides inside. How's it going in here? They've all had another two hours worth of limo champagne fed to them by their new handler, Kennedy, who looks slightly shell-shocked by their sudden, unexpected promotion. The women hoot and holler in response. They seem to be in the middle of a dance party. Dave briefly mourns the fact that he's not going to be spending the next nine weeks with these amazing women. Sorry I abandoned y'all, but they got me working with your Prince Charming. He's a little bit nervous about meeting so many beautiful women. A collective awe ripples through the limo. Perfect. I think he needs y'all to help him loosen up. Dave turns to Angie Griffin, the medical student and the next woman out of the carriage. Angie has a beautiful heart-shaped face framed by a pretty afro and bearing a mischievous smile, which suggests she's the perfect candidate for loosening up their tech nut. Here's what I'm thinking, Angie. What if you go out there and get him dancing a little bit? Dave shimmies his shoulders demonstratively. Angie appears to weigh the risk of potential humiliation on national television against the thrill of dancing with Charles Winshaw and slams back the rest of her limo champagne. Let's do it, she says excitedly, and Dave knows it will be perfect. That part is done. He climbs back out of the limo and jogs back to Charles for part two. I'm going to touch you again, Dave warns, and good lord, Charles blushes as Dave reaches up and adjusts his blonde curls beneath the crown. Dave can't imagine how he's going to survive nine weeks of being groped by the women. Okay, I need you to turn it on now. Turn it on? Charles repeats each word slowly, turning them over on his tongue. Dave watches his mouth puzzle it out, watches him press his tongue against the back of his very white, very straight teeth. Dave gently reminds himself to stop staring at this man's mouth. Yes, become the cologne ad guy. Whatever you used to do when you had to perform in front of crowds at Winhan, turn it on. The expression on Charles's face would be comical if it weren't so thoroughly pathetic, and if this man weren't at risk of ruining their entire show. You can do this, Dave says, without evidence or proof that he can, but he's good at putting his faith in things other people are quick to dismiss. I believe in you. Dave slides back out of the camera's view. When Angie comes out of the carriage a few minutes later, she sambas over to him and Charles doesn't look repulsed when he sees her. He lets Angie put his hands on, her hands on his hips and tango him around the courtyard, and he smiles genuinely for the cameras. It's reality television gold. 
Skylar sounds pleased in Dave's earpiece. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, sorry, I went no, too long. No, that was good. Thank you so much for sharing. Of course. Um, I just wanted to ask you a couple questions. Um, yes. Yeah. So, um, what prompted you to, or led you to write for um, the queer love stories? I mean, uh, and YA uh, was it the the genre is um, up and coming and new and um, being, uh, you know, was it some, what, what led you to write for that genre? Um, so I'm a lesbian. So as a member of the LGBTQIA community, um, I exclusively write um, queer love stories. Um, the book is also like very much adult, not YA. Um, I like tried to, to censor the, the language and uh, to, to various degrees of success. Um, but yes, it's uh, not a, a book for- Oh, I'm sorry. I was- No, you're totally fine. No. <laughs> okay. Just here, I was mentioning just to like clarify that it is sure. uh, it's adult romance book. Um, but yeah, so that is is part of, yeah, just being a member of the queer community. I actually wrote this book, um, the first draft of it in June of 2019 before I was out to people in my life, um, which is why I ended up writing a queer love story about male characters as opposed to about female characters, but yeah. And um, I'm gonna ask you this. Yeah, I heard that one. I didn't hear it before, but I heard that one. Um, I was gonna ask you the same question that I asked Heidi. Um, how has the shutdown and the, the situation in the world right now, has, has that affected your writing process? Yeah, similar, similar to Heidi, like in the beginning, I thought it was going to be fantastic. I was like, oh my gosh, I'll have so much time. I mean, I, as a teacher, we had that six weeks uh, closure back in, you know, March of 2020. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's like, I'll have all this extra time to write. Um, and of course, then like, COVID depression settled in and then I was teaching um, and writing at the same time. So I was kind of doing two full-time jobs and that was hard because it all happened in front of my computer screen. So I would get up and I would write before work and then I would teach all day from my computer and then I would try to write in the afternoon and evening. Um, and that was not the most enjoyable experience ever. Yeah, sitting in front of a computer all day takes its toll, it really does. Um, I was going to ask, um, you're, you said you're in New Mexico is, and you're currently, in, this minute, currently yes. in New Mexico. Are you, can you tell us a little bit about your future book that you're working on? And I'm going mean, to ask Heidi that after you're done. <laughs> yeah, I can't. So this, um, book two, my second book is like already sold and that will come out in, um, next year. So that's the Christmas rom-com. Um, it's a sapphic Christmas rom-com. So it's like a Hallmark Christmas movie, but instead it's like two women falling in love. Um, and then book three is very much still um, in the early drafting process. And um, so I can't really talk about it too much, but I've, it, I am um, I had to go to Ocean Springs, Mississippi for a bit to help out a friend um, and had to spend some some time there. Um, and then now I'm, I'm doing this drive. And so the book is kind of related to a road trip and Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And Heidi, I'm going to ask you too. I think you did touch a little bit on some of your upcoming um, works. Um, do you, are you working on anything currently that you want to talk about? Yeah, um, I have under my um, under my other pen name, um, I have this one coming out next month. This is an early copy. It's called Finding the Invisible Woman. Um, it's uh, the main character is mid 40s. Her children are grown. Um, her life is changing and morphing in different ways. And it's kind of about her rediscovering herself in the midst of two pretty significant stressful life changes. Um, so that when, um, that will be out next month. And then under the other pen name, the HR Mason, I have um, a supernatural suspense that I finished writing in August and it is in um, the submissions phase right now. So it's with my publisher to see if they like it, if they hate it, <laughs> if 
so I'm, you know, in that fun little, little waiting space right now with that one to see where it's going. That's awesome. Thank you. And congratulations to you both on your new upcoming books coming out. Thank you. Um, so if, is there anything um, that you hope your readers take away from um, your works, both of you? Um, is, is there something that you would like people to come away feeling? Um, uh, what kind of experience? Uh, do you do you like happy you want them to walk away feeling happy well um I think it all depends um <laughs> so my the it depends um on the book I guess um I think the even though I write in two different um genres and the books are very very different um some are light and happy and the others are are actually have much darker themes um I think what I always try to do, even though they are traditional romances, um, it's not traditional in the sense that the man doesn't save the woman. Um, the woman always saves herself. Um, and I think no matter under under both of um, both pen names, I think that that is the that's kind of the theme that it's it's not really about waiting to for someone to save you. It's more like finding the strength inside of yourself. Um, so I think that that's probably what most readers go away with, you know, with right. that feeling of, yeah, you can, you don't need someone to save you. You can totally save yourself. That's awesome. I love, I like that. I like that a lot. Allison. Oh, and Allison also, I forgot there's a question in there too, that is asking for um, where you got your inspiration for the reality dating aspect of the charm offense. So, uh, yeah, I watch a lot of reality dating shows, but definitely the, the show is like pretty strongly modeled after the bachelor franchise, um, in, in all capacities. Um, but in terms of what I want readers to walk away with, so I really liked what Heidi said about writing, you know, contemporary romance. So I, you know, as someone who writes queer romance and, and very specifically, um, I write queer romance about mental health and mental illness. Um, and so that is um, kind of what the charm offensive deal. So even though they're comedies, um, they also deal with those topics. And so the kind of number one thing I hope that readers walk away with is this idea that they are you know, everyone is deserving of the love story that they want and the happily ever after that they want in their life, no matter what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you both yeah. so much. Did anybody else have any other questions for Heidi or Allison? Okay. Um, I want to remind everybody again, um, Thanks, Stephen, for helping us. Um, he's put some lovely links in the chat for some of you that might be wondering how to get um, Allison and Heidi's books. Um, if um, any of you also want to go to uh, the link www.vintagebooks.net, you can also probably find um, most of their books. And um, if you would please refer back to your schedules to find the next session to attend today, that would be wonderful. And thank you again, Heidi and Allison. Um, it's been great having you here and it was wonderful to hear your books. And um, thank you everybody for coming. And um, I hope you enjoyed. And remember these are going to be, these um, have been recorded and they're going to be posted on our website at fbrl.org um, 